Hey there students, welcome to U.S. History EOC Intensive Review. This is our first of many segments and we'll be going through all of U.S. history and trying to get reviewed up for the EOC. And we're going to start at the very beginning with Standard 1.1 and that has to do with Colonial America. And first of all, let's look at our motives for colonizing. First of all, Religious motives. Now, that's going to be focused in New England, people going for religious motives. Keep in mind that one of the biggest things that you're going to have to do for this segment of the exam is to differentiate between the New England colonies, the middle colonies, and the southern colonies. So, religious motives. And the other motive for settlement would be economic. And the farther south you go, the more you're going to see people settling for economic motives. Whereas New England, it's going to be more religious. And in the middle colonies, you're going to have have a little bit of both. And so let's take a quick look at the 13 colonies. First of all, the New England colonies and really kind of Massachusetts would be a representative colony there. The Mid-Atlantic colonies or sometimes called the Middle colonies depending on what exam you're taking and what they choose to use. I would say that Pennsylvania would be a representative colony for the Mid-Atlantic or the Middle colonies. And then finally, the southern colonies, colonies such as Virginia and South Carolina would be representative, representative of these colonies. And so first of all, let's take a quick look at religion. New England, this is where people settled for religious freedom. Now keep in mind that religious freedom does not necessarily mean religious toleration. It doesn't mean religious freedom in the way that we think of it today, but it's people who were coming from England, Puritans and Separatists, coming in to New England so that they could build their city on a hill, so to speak. The Mid-Atlantic colonies, you have a limited amount of diversity. Now keep in mind that Maryland was for Catholics, then Pennsylvania founded by Quakers and really kind of for everybody. And then in some places like New York and New Jersey, you have established churches. But keep in mind that there is going to be more diversity and tolerance in the middle colonies than anywhere else. And finally, the southern colonies, which may strike you as odd that today the South is one of the more religious sections of the country, but during the colonial period, religion was not really a motive for colonization. It's really more all about the Benjamins. This is just for money. And so you think about the pilgrims, so to speak, uh, these English separatists, these Calvinists that came over so that they could practice their own religion. They were religious dissidents, people who were practicing a religion that at the time was illegal in England at the time of this religious uniformity under the Stuarts. So these are the type of people that settled in New England. And the Massachusetts Bay Colony, these Puritans, who were led by John Winthrop. John Winthrop is someone that you could see mentioned or quoted on an EOC test. And John Winthrop was the one who said that we were building a city on a hill. And this comes from the Bible. Now, of course, it's also been used by a lot of politicians, uh, predominantly Republican politicians. Ronald Reagan liked to use this symbolism. Mitt Romney did in his 2012 campaign as well. And then keep in mind that this was not a place for religious toleration. There were people such as Roger Williams and Ann Hutchinson who each in their own way advocated for a degree of religious toleration. Now both of these people were exiled from the Massachusetts colony. Roger Williams went on to found Rhode Island and then Ann Hutchinson went over there as well and then she and a lot of her children were massacred out there in the wilderness. But that's another story. Then we move on to the mid-Atlantic colonies where we have a limited amount of religious toleration and diversity. As I've mentioned, you have in Pennsylvania the Quakers. Now these were nonviolent people, these were pacifists, and they believed that nobody should ever be forced to do anything. They're called the Society of Friends even today. And the friends are not about forcing you to do anything, so everyone should have freedom of conscience. And then in Maryland, which was founded by Lord Baltimore, this was supposed to be a haven for Catholics. And Lord Baltimore actually proclaimed Christian toleration for any Trinitarian Christian. They could settle in Maryland and they could practice their religion freely. Now, if you weren't a Trinitarian Christian, then you die. But this was 
pretty progressive toleration for the time. And then we move on to the southern colonies where the Church of England was largely the established church, but at the same time, these people weren't moving there for religious reasons. They were moving there for economic reasons, which we'll talk about in just a bit. So remember, religion. First of all, religious freedom, quote unquote, in New England, and then religious diversity in the middle colonies to some extent, and in the southern colonies, religion was not really a motive for colonization. And so moving on to society, it's very important that we know how to compare and contrast New England society with southern society. We could get a question about that on your test. And what we're looking at in New England is a more egalitarian society where the clergy are the dominant class. Now, egalitarian, that comes from the same root as equality. Uh, this in French, it is egalité, or however you would pronounce that properly in French. Meanwhile, the Southern society was very hierarchical. Instead of the clergy being the dominant class, you've got a dominant class of landowners. And this creates a society where people know their place, uh, where people outrank others and everything kind of uh, fits together like that. And the southern colonies, the economy was driven by plantation slavery. And this, of course, adds to this social hierarchy. When slaves are introduced, now, of course, at first, this work is done by indentured servants, but in the 17th century, you see that plantation slavery is established as the dominant agricultural labor force by the end of that century. And let's take a look at English political traditions. All right, first of all, you've got the Magna Carta. And second, you've got the Parliament. Now, I'm going to talk about this a little bit more in the next segment, but it's good to go ahead and introduce that uh, because this appears in the, in the guide at this point. And also, it informs us about the traditions in colonial America. So the Magna Carta and Parliament. The Magna Carta symbolizing taxation by consent and the Parliament being a representative body. So when we look at English political traditions, we see that first, the English have given us popular government, government that comes from the people, that the people have a say in the government. Secondly, we have traditions of representative government that we get from the English. So these twin traditions of popular government and representative government. And in New England, you see that popular government is being manifested in the form of town meetings. You can still see presidential candidates that are going to New Hampshire that participate in town meetings. And these are egalitarian, they're democratic, they take votes by the majority. If you think about the Mayflower Compact, that's where they get together and they say, okay, we're going to commit ourselves to majority rule and that sort of thing. Now, meanwhile, in the southern colonies, the House of Burgesses in Virginia is representative of this, pun intended. And this is a representative body and is pretty aristocratic because the landowners are represented here more than anyone else. So the landowners are dominant here. They are making decisions. But keep in mind, we still have this tradition of representative government in the colonies. Now let's move on to the economy. Now, first of all, you've got New England, which was kind of an exception. Whereas the colonies were predominantly agricultural, keep in mind the point of a colony is to grow raw materials and export them to the mother country in exchange for finished goods. So New England's share of this was in the commerce segment. All right, so commerce, shipbuilding, fishing, really anything to do if you think about things going on at sea and having to do with trade and that sort of thing, that is... The economy of the New England colonies. Keep in mind the growing season's pretty short, the soil's pretty rocky, it's not that great compared to the other colonies. Then the mid-Atlantic colonies, you're dealing with staple crops. All right, now a staple crop is a crop that we eat. And what you see here, things like wheat and corn, and these are grown on family farms. Uh, you're going to see a lot of family farms. If you think about even today in Pennsylvania, you've got the Amish and other groups like that that still operate on that model. So staple crops, family farms, wheat, corn. 
Now the southern colonies, the economy is based on cash crops. We're talking about tobacco, rice, indigo. Now of course rice is cheap today so you don't really think of that as a cash crop but at the time rice was pretty expensive because there were only certain places where people knew it would grow and the low country in South Carolina was one of those. Now these cash crops were predominantly harvested by slave labor. Now of course not everybody in the South was a slave owner but most of the money was being made at large plantations and growing these cash crops. Now tobacco would be another cash crop. I think I've already, yeah, I've already mentioned tobacco. Okay, but anyway, tobacco, important crop, especially in North Carolina and Virginia and such. And keep in mind as far as trade goes, what you've got here is the triangular trade where as I mentioned, you've got the colonies which produce raw goods, raw materials, agricultural products and that sort of thing, timber, lumber, all of that. And then they trade with Europe and the Europeans export finished goods, they import the raw goods. And then Africa you would get slaves. So you go to the colonies for raw materials, you go to Europe for finished goods, and Africa for slaves. Now this triangular trade can get a little bit more complex. If you take a look at the Caribbean, for example, you've got the sugar crop that's going to be dominant there. And you could run between the Caribbean and the 13 colonies trading sugar. You can trade uh, slaves, you can trade finished goods, but keep in mind all of these different trade routes that are going through the Atlantic world. And mercantilism was a system of economic regulation that governed trade. All right, now keep in mind for U.S. history, the main thing you need to know about mercantilism is that mercantilism governed trade in the colonies. And the Navigation Acts passed in 1651, this was the piece of legislation that governed this mercantilist economy where the British colonies are supposed to trade with either other British colonies or the mother country. Now the thing about the Navigation Acts is that they weren't strictly enforced. What I think about is a speed limit. When you think about it, every once in a while you see a sign that says speed limit strictly enforced. Ha ha. Because really, how many people really get pulled over for going one mile or two miles above the speed limit? Not very many. So if you see a speed limit, it'd be nice to have an 85 mile an hour speed limit. We don't quite have those in this state. Uh, don't know if you got them anywhere. Maybe in Montana or something. But yeah, Texas has some that are, that are close to that, if not around there. Okay, so yeah, don't mess with Texas. But anyway, thank you to the live studio audience that we've got here. Now, so these Navigation Acts are strictly enforced and we call this salutary neglect. Now keep in mind, typically when we think about neglect, child neglect or something like that, we're thinking about something that's bad. But then if you think about, if your parents went out of town for the weekend and they left you at home with a little bit of cash to get yourself some food if you need and they tell you, oh, don't throw a party or anything like that. And you are thinking, wow, this is good neglect. All right, y'all go away for the weekend anytime you would like. So think about this neglect in that way as if your parents just left you alone for the weekend or something like that. And this is the situation the colonies are in, which is going to lead to the tensions after the French and Indian War between the colonists and the mother country because here they've been left alone for a big long weekend. Imagine an entire summer or year or something like that and then all of a sudden mom and dad are going to come home and it's going to be time to pony up. All right, and they're not going to like that. And that concludes this segment. We'll be moving on to the next segment, which is dealing with English traditions of government. See you in a bit.